going to hear from California Representative John Garamendi, who's joining us virtually today. As many of you know, he authored and passed the very bipartisan Ocean Shipping Reform Act in response to fees charged to American exporters like the farmers in his district. He's continuing his work with the maritime shipping industry by supporting the Op Ocean Shipping Antitrust Enforcement Act to increase competition with ocean carriers and bring down costs to American exporters. And we know how vitally important exports are to California agriculture. The congressman grew up on a family ranch in Northern California before attending UC Berkeley where he received a degree in business and we're very pleased to have him make comments to you right now and take some of your questions after his opening comments. So, Congressman, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much. It's great to be with you. I uh, should have tuned in a few minutes earlier and listened to most of what Mr. Crowfoot had to say. We've been working together trying to uh, finalize the final, final steps on the uh, off-stream reservoir. We'll see if we can get it done, but we'll have it uh, hopefully done very, very quickly, the sites reservoir. Beyond that, uh, let's just jump right into it. It was almost uh, two years ago now that the farmers in my district brought to me the question of how do they get their exports? How are they possibly going to continue farming if they can't get their uh, crops, uh, the harvest onto the ships? I said, first, we can't get containers. If we can get the containers, we can't get them on a ship. And so we began working on that. Along the path, I ran into a fellow from South Dakota, Dusty Johnson, uh, who said, geez, you're working on this. I've got a problem in uh, South Dakota, the Midwest. Uh, it's a problem with the dairies. It's a problem with the soybeans and the rest. Uh, let's work together. And we did. The Ocean Shipping Reform Act is now law. And it does empower the uh, Federal Maritime Commission to actually solve the problem. However, it doesn't completely solve the problem. Therefore, we have two additional bills that we're going to be pushing forward. Uh, before I get to those, let's just wrap up the uh, Ocean Shipping Reform Act. It lays out a series of uh, uh, programs for the Federal Maritime Commission uh, to enforce. It provides the enforcement power that the Commission previously did not have and the money and the staff to actually regulate this critical uh, international commerce. Now that that's done, we have two other bills, one of which you just mentioned, which deals with the antitrust exemption that the ocean shipping carriers presently have. This exemption goes back almost 25 years, long before China ever entered the World Trade Organization and before the consolidation that has so much occurred within the uh, international shipping business. There are five major carriers that serve the Pacific, and there are 10 or nine carriers that serve both the Atlantic and the Pacific, and they can conspire to set rates, to set uh, fees, uh, availability of cargo, and the like. And so the antitrust bill, which is principally offered by Jimmy Costa from California and myself, uh, will deal with that by removing that exemption and force these carriers or eliminate the ability of these carriers uh, to conspire to regulate or to withhold uh, the shipping opportunities as well as the rates that are being charged. Of course, they claim they don't do it. Well, good, then they won't bother if their exemption is eliminated. The second and third piece of legislation that we're putting together is a follow-up uh, to the previous two. And this one is something that I learned again from the farmers as well as from the uh, agricultural exporters and the work that we did working with the uh, port and the port commissioners up and down the West Coast. And that is, we all knew from the reports, uh, television and other reports, that there were dozens, if not hundreds of ships waiting to get to the docks uh, and literally in a queue. I asked the question, well, how do you get to the front of the queue? And there was a lot of evasive answers. In fact, no direct answer. It turns out that there is a 
informal queuing system that does presently exist. Uh, first of all, it, uh, in that queue are military shipments and then Jones Act shipments and uh, specific uh, Coast Guard allocations. And that's an informal queue. But is there a queue for ships that, a place in that queue for ships that are going to actually take cargo out of the ports, that is exports from California and other West Coast ports? The answer is there is no such queue. Well, what we've done is to put forth a bill called the Port Access Privileges Act. And it basically adds to the queue the, um, a, a second preference. And that preference goes to international shippers that are going to work multiple West Coast ports or East Coast ports and take a significant amount of American export. Uh, thereby running past what has become a major problem for the Oakland uh, and some of the uh, Washington, Oregon ports where ships simply avoid, they go to LA, Long Beach, load up with empty containers, maybe a few containers that are filled with exports, and then head back to the Western Pacific. What this would do is if they want to get to the front of the queue, they must be willing to also go to Oakland uh, up to uh, the Columbia ports as well as the ports in Washington state, or take a large amount of American exports, that is the containers. And so that's the, Ameri the Port Access Privilege Act. These three pieces of legislation will complete the work that we are doing, at least for now, until we find additional problems. We're very hopeful that uh, all three of these bills will become law. Uh, we're going to push them very hard. We're working them once again on a bicameral, bipartisan legislation, and uh, we'll see what goes. The success is going to be, depend upon all of you that are participating in this conference. And that is, it was your advocacy, your willingness to step up, shout, advocate, lobby, work with us, work with others, work with those who are saying no to persuade them to finally say yes. So on these two additional pieces of legislation, we seek once again to work very closely with all of you so that we can get these bills passed and then provide a very robust opportunity for American exporters to get their exports on a ship. And for our farmers, this is critically important. I know that there are additional problems, perhaps we'll discuss those along the way, but these three pieces of legislation go right to the heart of the problem. And we intend to make all three the laws of the land. Thank you so very much. I'll take questions that you might have now. Great, Congressman. So this is time for you to use your Slido and to uh, ask them any questions for the Congressman. I'm gonna start out with one because I'm pretty sure you saw the headlines in the LA Times last week that over one billion pounds of almonds are still stranded at the ports. And I, I know you understand the risks involved here for the farmers in California. That's a really big backlog, but how do you see we're gonna work our way out of that while we still have pending legislation? Do you think the Maritime Commission is gonna be able to act any quicker? Or what sort of pathways do you see to start to solve this problem? Well, unfortunately, it's not just a problem for almonds. It's a problem for most every American export, including exports from, uh, let's say, uh, some of the big retailers. Uh, who have stores in the Western Pacific. And so how can we do this? First of all, the legislation in and of itself is a wake up call to the ports. The ports do not need legislation to do what is in the uh, Ports Access Privilege Act. They can do this on their own. Uh, they have to stand up to the big uh, international shipping companies and say, no, we're going to uh, put it at the front of the line. And we're going to push hard for them to do that while the legislation is in process. Uh, similarly, the uh, antitrust legislation puts a significant amount of pressure on the international shipping companies. They don't want that bill to pass. And therefore, we have an opportunity in the near term to use persuasion with these two pieces of legislation as a hammer uh, to encourage a proper conduct. So that is the immediate thing. The other uh, is for the uh, agricultural exporters and other exporters 
to bang on the ports. The uh, port operators have the power to solve the queuing issue all by themselves. Uh, they may not do it without a law, but with enough uh, persuasion, uh, perhaps they will provide a better opportunity for our experts by queuing to the front of the line those ships that are going to take a significant volume of exports or go from Long Beach, LA to Oakland and then on up the Pacific coast. So um, thank you for that response. We've st started to get a few questions in from the audience as well. And this one mirrors one that I noted recently, I got a release from the Port of Oakland that the year over year in May that they'd had a 0.5% increase in exports year over year. Um, that compares with, in Georgia, the Port Authority is reporting uh, record high volume up 8.5%. And our questionnaire wants to know, what can we do to modernize the West Coast ports, enabling this automation similar to the technologies that are not only on the East Coast ports, but European and Asian ports that are so much quicker? Well, first of all, with, report of Oak, with the Port of Oakland, uh, the volume there uh, is not a result of the, uh, the port's efficiency or lack thereof, but rather sh cargo ships that are willing to uh, come into the port and take cargo. Uh, and that's why we're passing the port's access bill or want it, want it to pass. Uh, with regard to the infrastructure on the ports, in the Infrastructure Jobs Act, uh, which became law without a single Republican senator. We did have 12 Republican members of Congress. That piece of legislation has a significant amount of money for port improvement, uh, expansion of the various systems on the port, uh, providing um, off port intermodal access uh, so that the rail cars and the trucks are able to uh, access the ports quickly get back onto the uh, intercontinental rail lines as well as the intercontinental roads and uh, highways freeways and the like so that money is there that money is now being drawn down uh, it would be a good question to uh, uh, to put to the state of california the department of transportation i know that my staff and i have been working with them on this together with the ports uh, the money is available the ports have to put together their plan on how they would uh, what they intend to do, uh, and uh, the inter intermodal systems, which are off the ports, uh, those are three steps. First of all, the port needs to have its plans together, going then to the regional transportation agencies, uh, both in Southern California as well as in the Bay Area, and then the state of California uh, blessing those plans and then the money flowing into those particular uh, roadblocks and uh, speed bumps that do occur. Uh, the final point here is the, uh, the fees that are paid by the shippers. Every container, uh, there's a fee attached to it. This is the Harbor Maintenance Fund. Uh, we passed legislation in this Congress last year to require that every dollar collected in the Harbor Maintenance Fund be spent on the ports. Mostly that money will go for port dredging. However, we modified the law so that it can go for on the dock improvements. And so all of that money is available. It's up to the ports to get their act together, to apply for the funds and to move forward with the, uh, with the various projects. Uh, one thing that is on all of our mind and there's probably a question coming up, so let me get it out of the way. And that is the uh, current negotiations that are underway uh, between the uh, longshoremen and the port operators. Uh, I've been in discussion with uh, the longshoremen and the port operators over the last uh, 10 days. And while the current contract has expired, both sides say that they believe that they will have a contract uh, in short order, and it will be a contract that will increase the efficiency of the port. So you're optimistic that there will be a new contract and that there will be an opportunity for improvements in automation along with that contract? 
Uh, yes, uh, it's interesting that the uh, ILWU has always accepted automation, but they don't want to lose the jobs. And so the question here is the expansion of the job opportunities on the ports. And uh, there are numerous ways that that can be done. Uh, the automation is, uh, as, as I've heard from them, is not the issue. The issue is, can the jobs that would be modified or changed by the automation be transferred to other tasks on the port? And I believe that's what they're negotiating at the present time. And of course, there are wages and perhaps other working conditions. But uh, as I said, the most recent conversations I had from both sides is that they are optimistic that there will not be a strike. Another question from our audience has come in since you've encouraged people to offer their import, uh, their comments and, and to lift up this issue. What exactly would you like to see in terms of a public-private sector partnership that can, that can really have an impact? How can these groups that are in the room, some of the leaders in California agriculture and agribusiness, how can they work together to really help solve the problem at the ports? Well, I've covered many of the issues already, and I said that advocacy is critically important. Uh, there's an annual meeting of the uh, exporters and the shippers, uh, the international shippers. Uh, generally, or historically, the exporters, particularly the ag exporters, have not attended that meeting. And that's a, that is a, uh, an opportunity for advocacy. And I would recommend that uh, the ag exporters and their representatives of the various agricultural commodity groups attend that annual meeting and any other quarterly meeting uh, that, uh, that does take place. As I've already talked about advocacy. Uh, they should do that. Uh, also, there are some, uh, I think, I would say innovative ways of uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, I think I'm going to withhold exactly how this works. I don't think it's in the public yet. But there are multiple organizations that are in the transportation sector. Uh, the rail lines, the truck lines, uh, the individual truck operators. Uh, there are also uh, organizations that own containers and then own the uh, uh, the, the uh, way in which the containers are moved around the docks. Uh, one of the problems we have is that these multiple organizations are not well coordinated. And it seems to me that the exporters, ag exporters in this case, should be working with the port uh, the ports and the operators on the ports to seek ways to increase the efficiency. Uh, and this may simply be scheduling uh, and work out a scheduling, uh, an arrival uh, that would be the lead, create the least congestion or operate at a time when there is less congestion. Uh, so that would be one, uh, I don't know if you call that a partnership, but I think it would be a way in which you can uh, develop um, ways in which you can get your products to the port. Uh, secondly, uh, working with the various uh, middle uh, companies that operate in the middle that uh, expedite the shipments or arrange for the shipments, uh, developing working relationships with those and in fact, make them compete with each other. You may have your favorite uh, intermediary good but you probably would be well served to have uh, at least a communication with another or maybe more than one intermediary uh, to see where who you might be able to get the best service from and finally um, there may be roundabout ways to get your product on a ship by working with organizations that have um, many dozens of uh, or hundreds of containers that would arrive at the port at the same time and go on one ship. So they're just ways you're going to have to work the angles until we get these laws in, in place and operating. 
I know you've been working very closely with the White House and the Port Czar, Mr. Picari, on a lot of these issues. And one of our <coughs> questioners wants to know whether there's any chance that the president would waive the Jones Act, which, as you know, um, dates back to 1920 and requires uh, movement uh, ships that are moving between U.S. ports be a U.S. flag. The problem is not a Jones Act problem. It's not a it's not a problem of one port to another American port, one American port to another American port. Uh, it's the international shipping that's a problem right now. So waiving the Jones Act will have very little to do that with that. I have been working with one, well, the two uh, Jones Act international carriers uh, that uh, service Hawaii, Guam, and one of them actually goes on to um, Japan and China. Uh, that, uh, the good news is, for their point of view, is that they're fully loaded out of the West Coast ports to go to Hawaii, and then they pick up from Hawaii and go to Guam. Uh, they, do not, they do not or did not have um, capacity to uh, load onto that Jones Act ship containers that would go all the way to Japan, Korea, or to uh, China. Now that changes over time. And I suggested to them that they look at this as an opportunity. Uh, there are some new ships that are coming online for that uh, international trade. Uh, the East Coast is really different. Uh, and I know some of the uh, California agricultural commodities have been going to the Gulf states uh, to be shipped uh, from there to the European and markets beyond. Uh, my understanding is that's limited, but nonetheless, it does occur. Once again, that's not a Jones Act issue. Okay. Um, one other question related to the ports and transport is, uh, of course, the concern about truck drivers and the uh, holdups that they've had. Also, a uh, questioner wants to know, is there anything being done to to help the nearly 70,000 owner-operated truck drivers to comply or gain exemption to AB5, which could further choke supply chains? Well, here's what I say. That's an issue for the California legislature and the governor, uh, AB5 <laughs> being a California law. Um, I, I think the issue here comes down to uh, the question of uh, rest time. There are other complexities involved, but what I've heard mostly is rest time. And part of this is a port access issue. From what I've heard is that the, uh, the, the truckers may be stacked up at the port for several hours or longer, and that does not count as rest time. And so uh, there, there's some talk that if you're sitting if your truck is sitting and you're just waiting to get access to the port, could that be counted as rest time? Don't know the answer to it. That may be one thing. There is another issue that uh, we are pursuing here vigorously, and it is in the uh, Infrastructure Jobs Act bill, and that is uh, rest areas, the creation of uh, creating more rest areas. I know, uh, well, you're in Sacramento right now, all of you, and uh, I'm sure some of you are going to be headed up five. And by the time you get to the uh, 99 I-5 split, you'll see one of the bigger rest areas in Sacramento. It's right there at that interchange. Uh, not a good thing. So uh, we're putting together, there is a lot of money for increasing rest areas. That may help along the way. With regards specifically to AB5, uh, I suppose I could lobby if I'm giving specific information for many of you. Well, we know you're very passionate and very involved in the ports issues, but we do have a couple other subject matters for you before we let you go. Um, one of our questioners is uh, very thankful for your support of California Ag with the Biomass for Electric Vehicles Act and wants to know whether there's anything new out of EPA on adding so-called electric fuel to the RFS. Uh, the answer is, no, and I don't think we're going to see it. The Supreme Court decision a week ago goes right to the heart of the ability of EPA to um, 
develop regulations that are not specifically enumerated, that is purposes specifically enumerated by Congress. This had to do with the clean uh, emissions from power plants. And uh, it is a, uh, it may very well prohibit uh, the EPA from dealing with this issue. Uh, therefore, the legislation may very well be necessary. We don't have clarity on this yet. Uh, that EPA decision is uh, extraordinarily important. While uh, a lot of people don't like EPA regulations, they are the principal protections for public health. And uh, so we'll see what happens here. Uh, with this particular piece of legislation, we will continue to push it. We're getting pretty good uh, traction here in Congress. Uh, we're looking to put it into another piece of legislation that uh, is likely to pass in the next uh, four or five months. Uh, so we're very hopeful that we'll be able to do this. Uh, this, um, at least two of us are aware of the legislation. I'll try to uh, very quickly describe it. Right now we have the renewable fuel standards. Uh, if you're growing corn uh, and making ethanol, this is really cool. But we're going to have electric vehicles. And uh, so how does the renewable fuel standard apply to electric vehicles? Well, it really doesn't. And so if we are, uh, if you are using biomass to generate electricity, we're saying that that should be counted to the same way as uh, ethanol is counted as a substitute for electric energy generated by carbon fuels. So that's basically what it would be as we move to a more electric vehicle society. Uh, this would put in place a way in which biomass generating electricity would be a substitute just as ethanol is for petroleum. And uh, last question for you before we close. You've got, uh, I know you're back in Washington. You've got about three weeks here um, before the August recess. Of course, we've got the midterm elections coming up. Can you give us your preview in addition to the bills that you're trying to get passed and to address ports issues? Um, what, what do you see as moving here in the next few weeks? Uh, and does any of that include part of the build back better in a scaled back way? And would that be climate? What, what do you see ahead in the next couple of weeks? Uh, you gave me a very, very short time frame here. Uh, the next couple of weeks, I do know that uh, I will be very busy for the next couple of weeks on the National Defense Authorization Act uh, as a one of the chairman of about 40% of this $800 billion that'll be in that bill. I'll be very, very busy with that, at least for the next two weeks. The third week, the last week, uh, we'll be dealing with, uh, we've got a long agenda here. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, make it relevant to what uh, may be of interest here. Uh, there's uh, voting rights legislation that is, continues to move along uh, in the House. Uh, there will be an additional uh, follow-up on some of the uh, gun safety bills. The president just uh, attended a White House ceremony about an hour and a half ago. Uh, the president made a very, very strong pitch for uh, military assault weapons, uh, dealing with that, uh, that issue, uh, which California has, but the, uh, the federal government has not. Uh, we'll also be dealing with the uh, some of the uh, environmental issues that will be important to agriculture, uh, specifically um, the bioenergy legislation that was, uh, that is in the uh, Build Back Better piece of it. I don't think that's likely to be completed, but that will be pushed along. And in that legislation, there are some very good things for agriculture, some of which I talked about, uh, and a lot more uh, that would be out there for agriculture, providing uh, alternative power sources, uh, green power sources of many different kinds. <sighs> Infrastructure, pretty much have completed that work for this year. Uh, there'll be uh, the uh, Build Back Better legislation. I think that's basically it for the next three weeks. Beyond that, we'll be picking up uh, most all of the things that have not passed. 
a slim down, build back better. Uh, some things in this maybe have, uh, may, may be in July. Uh, there's a series of things in that bill that have to do with education, child care, funding, early childhood education. Uh, many of the programs that agriculture has had for a long time for uh, um, agricultural workers, uh, child care programs for the Head Start programs, things of that sort, are in the Build Back Better legislation. Uh, so uh, I doubt that that's going to be done in the next two weeks. That'll probably be um, in September or even after the elections. All right. Well, you have covered a tremendous amount of information for us today. We're very thankful you could be with us virtually. Thank you so much. And let's show our appreciation to the Congressman for his remarks.